Okay, any second. Well, he was a smoker. <laughs> so that, you know, irritated his ways. <laughs> he died of that, too. I know, he was a heavy smoker. Okay, yeah. we're live. Oh, we are live. And I'm Humphrey Bogart. And uh, <laughs> frankly, we're going to be good friends for a while here, everybody. <laughs> Welcome aboard. We're happening, baby. We're moving into the Flashman this Friday night. It's a big auditorium at the museum and our hot little astrophysics club, the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit, based at and supported by, I might add, the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, a beautiful place up in Mission Canyon, and the Riviera of the Pacific, Santa Barbara, California. Not only we're going to be featured uh, with Professor Adenucci's trip way back to the other side of the solar uh, solar so the, uh, galaxy and his expertise on, uh, uh, what are they called again? Uh, Glomars. Quasars. I just walked into a room. Objects. I walked into a room while ago and said, what the hell am I doing in here? And I don't think that's <laughs> dementia, but it's damn close. My name's Ron here, and I'm with the club, SBAU. Go to sbau.org. Please join us. We're getting all kinds of people at our meetings these days, and we got one this coming Friday night. This is program number 119, going into our third year. And it's for, what, May 29th through June 4th. I'll introduce you to the fellow, the fellow Brain Trust members here, but today we're going to talk about the moon, which is uh, going through waxing. We have a waxy moon for some reason. Mm -hmm. Down to the wire, we're going to ground check Saturn from down here and some of its moons. Rings are going to sort of disappear in a couple of years, I understand. We'll explain that. On the moon, uh, sounds like they got a mountain range named after a, an old a Third Reich German general, Mons Rumka. A mountain range, other planets in the sky, and we've spotted a supernova, I think, or a collapsed star or something in a nearby galaxy. Binaries are us out in Virgo, and we're going to talk spectroscopy this hour. How spectro... Never mind. I'll just, well, I wouldn't get that. <laughs> Not after this close. I'm, my name is Ron Heron, and I'm proud to be your host, and let's meet the proud general himself, captain of the starship, our president, Jerry Wilson. Who I Good understand, morning. I understand has had many trips around the sun. Some, a couple, a couple more than I have. I understand. <laughs> we'll know about that it this was weekend. It's a little confusing to me. I don't know if that was meant seventy nine or eighty. Ah, uh, we'll find out. We won't say too much unless he volunteers it. The man sitting in front of the flag of Ukraine is our incredible outreach coordinator, Chuck McPartland. <laughs> who, uh, along with his wife, the merchandise manager, Pat McPartland, have taken over secretarial duties for the club and are just doing a damn outright, outreachable job. That's got to stop. I'm sorry, Chuck. Forget <laughs> about sending us those minutes. Here we got a, a Tom Whittemore, who was making Morning. grand days, but used to be the star of the Westmont campus, as far as some of us are concerned. He's married to Maureen. Uh, Jerry Wilson, incidentally, his wife, Pat Forge, sent out the notices to us, and we're not going to talk more about it. Tom Totten's not with us, but we do have Bruce Murdoch, whose wife is Bronnie, and he spreads himself among all kinds of things, but I think he likes us best. Even though he is president of the Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society, longtime active member, Bruce, I know oh, he's out there, give us a report on Refugio. First of all, before we go to the topics at heart, and I always learn a lot every week, uh, we have some levity. Uh, the president sends out these cartoons, science comics, that are sometimes outrageously funny, other times groaners. Uh, <laughs> uh, here we go. That's either Calvin or Hobbes. Which one is he? Calvin? Calvin. And he's swinging. Whee! And he says, Houston, we have a negative on that orbit trajectory. We have a problem. <laughs> Actually, it's Apollo. Oh, I love this one. A toilet drone. <laughs> I wonder if this is real. I, it looks at, doesn't it? I don't know. If Probably it was... an art installation. I have no idea. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. See the, the title up top, Lifestyle Department Art. Yeah. Wow. If it did come to your house, apparently uh, the joke is, uh, what is the joke? The future has arrived. Now you do not need to run and look for a public toilet. It'll come to you. Service mm -hmm. allows you to call the toilet. It's like office. getting an Uber. Well, it's either Uber. I, I think it's probably more of a lift. But I notice it doesn't have any plumbing hookup, so... <laughs> oh, it's a wall-mounted toilet. Yeah. Well, it, the flesh is out of the bottom when it's airborne, and just be careful where you are if it goes over. All right. 
Melody dates a black hole. This is kind of interesting. She sits across from <laughs> a black hole. And Pretty good. I'm not saying she's sucked into this man, but we have nothing in common, yet I'm strangely attracted to you. <laughs> and that's the black hole. And here's the doctor at the bedside of the dying man. You could go at any time now, son. He goes, ha, ah, I did it. I lived my whole life without ever at once using algebra. A lot of people think that way. Yeah, he just thinks. Yeah. Okay, some people think scientists exclaim, Eureka, when doing experiments. But they're more likely to say, oh, bollocks. And I'm not going to say the other words. You say them if you want. Even though I figured <laughs> you're not, the word turd sandwich went around on the networks this morning. Mm -hmm. As far as the Biden and uh, McCarthy settlement on the extension of the debt. I hate science, it says at the very end. Stupid yeah. beats. <laughs> Actually, the most common one that I would have put on there was, oh, what's that? <laughs> what the hell happened? Oh, here's a This secret. wasn't a cartoon, but it's an interesting photograph. Yeah, it is. It's uh, two photographs of the same thing. One is zoomed in. Yeah, one yeah. zoomed in. Looks like a scene from a Nicolas Cage movie. I'm sorry. I know, it's the start of a science fiction show. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> and all right, a walking... All right, blow, blow Lord that of light. Uh, we are looking at AI at the computer screen that's talking. No, the guy says, our AI has just evolved beyond self-awareness to self-loathing. And it says, who am I kidding? My writing stinks. I get that. Every true, every true writer goes through that. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the grammar the grammar is even wrong. Oh, that's <laughs> probably true. Madam and Eve, now, where are we here? Region of space exhibiting such strong gravitational effects that nothing, not even light, can escape it. I didn't know that. Scientists call this phenomenon a black hole. Objects sucked into a black hole disappear, never to be seen again. And the two women are talking, and that's what happened to your sock. In the <laughs> Black holes have all our socks. There's another cartoon I saw that shows that um, socks that disappear in the laundry return as Tupperware lids that don't fit any of the Tupperware bowls you have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if science will ever... Okay, this one you're going to need to explain a little bit, how a rocket works. It's not rocket science, but maybe it is. No idea, no idea. Witchcraft? Is this the uh, uh, astrologist version of... Rocketry? Oh, no, this is the political version of uh, oh. rockets for politicians. Well, I think it's an amazing time we live in, gentlemen, with all these private firms competing. Yeah. Prove, prove you are not human. The uh, AI screen says to the <laughs> robot, there are no more humans. And the AI says, correct. And they're laughing about it. <laughs> we aren't, though, are we? <laughs> Okay, bad dog. Drop mommy's voodoo doll. Bad dog, and he's shaking the doll. <laughs> like that, yeah. This is called quantum entanglement. <laughs> okay, you got to know your quantum to know what that means. Yeah. yeah. But that's and how that's the last one. Oh, you're not going to do that recliner button thing. No, that's, that's way too complicated. I couldn't even get through it. I it's, We could send it out to everybody. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, but can we have a quick report from the gentlemen who were out over the weekend, Chuck? Uh, uh, what you were out or Refugio Beach? Is that where we were? No, no, Refugio Beach is coming up next Saturday. Oh, it's coming. All right. Um, um, but um, I, I, we had a couple of events that were canceled: Hope School and uh, Los, uh, Flores. Los Flores Ranch Park, um, and uh, just because of clouds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some people say we only have two or maybe three seasons here. Cloudy, windy, and maybe some sun in the fall or and clear skies. That's your season for telescope, right? Fall, winter? Um, I, well, comes and goes. We've, we, have, we have the fog overlap, you know, in the summer. And then in the fall, we have fires that fill our sky with smoke. Yeah. Oh, you're right. So, but they now got words for every, let's see, about four months. I've been seeing some yeah. of them posted on nextdoor.com. Besides May Gray, June mm -hmm. Bloom, Foggest, somebody came up with, July. Oh, July, no sky, August, the foggiest. And there, there's even one for April. I forget what, well, Grapeful. I think they put GR in front Gra of it. April? <laughs> Grapeful, okay. Oh, or gray, <laughs> not grape, okay. <laughs> Well, there's vast clouds of hydrogen out there. There's a waxing gibbous moon. God knows where we're going to go first here. Ah, the night sky. Like our planetarium show before the meetings. Here we are. Now, um, 
because the moon is just past first quarter mm -hmm. um, and if it's it's starting to get bright enough that it's interfering with faint fuzzy so this is probably the last session for about two weeks that we will look at faint fuzzies and this is one of the faintest in my view it's the north american nebula which is a complex of hydrogen gas clouds in uh, cygnus up near deneb and that's what the bullseye is centered on that's where uh the sky six puts puts it if you ask it to come up with ngc 7000 which is the north american nebula and that's this is what that looks like in a long exposure um probably taken through a hydrogen alpha filter because this is a mass of hydrogen and you can see the florida and the gulf of mexico and mexico going down here there this has got so much extra stuff this is not what you see in, in most photos this is heavily processed this is the pelican nebula you can see the pelican's head and his beak down there oh. and his stout little body the the caption gives a hydrogen alpha and sulfur and o3 filters <clears throat> yes okay that's right a nebula in North America is named so named because you can't see it in South Africa and Australia. <laughs> no, <laughs> looks like North America. Looks like North America was discovered by somebody here. All right, gotcha. Oh, looks like North America. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. can see the Caribbean Sea and uh, the. Oh, I okay. It is kind of a. Go it's more obvious if you just do the hydrogen view, or yeah. drop yes. rugs. <laughs> yeah, all this extra orange stuff is distracting from it, but that's probably the sulfur. Yeah, I'm sure it's sulfur. It looks good through an O3 filter all by itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not a reflection. Well, I think the, the one I'm familiar with is a H2 filter that really shows this up. And the nice thing about these very narrow band filters that we, uh, Chuck just listed for this photo is that, that they defeat light pollution. So you can take this type of picture even from a city huh. so these are nests of making new stars nurseries and the ones we're seeing superimposed are they in the nebulas one, or before or i'm not sure that these are dense enough to be qualify as a nursery of star nursery like the orion nebula i would guess those are foreground, jerry pardon i would guess those are foreground stars wouldn't you yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. And and if you've got full spectrum lighting like some of the new LEDs, these filters won't help you much. Well, they do help a little because there's not even though the, the LED covers the broad spectrum, um, you're not taking pictures over a broad spectrum. So it gets a more fair competition. Well, if you could get rid of the blue, then you would get rid of a lot of the light pollution in the sky. Huh. This this color blue is assigned. It's an uh, it's a um, what is false it color? Called? False color, yeah. But what and, I was saying is the LED streetlights uh, have a very large output in the blue because they start with a blue yeah. LED. Yeah, and the our sky our our atmosphere scatters that light. Well, some of that color stuff is going to be discussed later when we hit spectroscopy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we'll get to that. That's the feature, the main feature for tonight's matinee. <laughs> um, this is a, Cygnus is a very dense region. You can see the Milky Way going up through here, and the North American Nebula is part of that part of the Milky Way. Over here, we're looking just past the Milky Way in uh, Lyra, and you have M57, the Ring Nebula, right there at the pointer finger. And there's all sorts of other things around here in this part of the sky, too. Yeah, it's and very this, rich. Very rich. Yes, very rich place. Okay. okay. Moving right along. Looking at M101 mm -hmm. uh, up in um, Ursa Major. Right off the, if you take Mizar and Alcade, the last two stars of the handle of the Milky Way, this forms an equilateral triangle with it to get to the object M101, which is a spiral galaxy. This yep. is a single frame photograph of that galaxy. And the net um, supernova is shown right here. 
um, earlier supernovas used to just be highlighted with an arrow, but now it's they're they're showing um, partial crosshairs. Yeah, makes it makes it a lot easier to find Jerry with your telescope. Yes, it does. <laughs> and and we showed people uh, the supernova um, last weekend when we were up at uh, Los Olivos. Uh, we got it in the Malin cam and we're showing it. Okay. It was pretty obvious. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, it's been overcast here. I'm getting very frustrated. <laughs> that makes two this of us. Shows, this shows a um, one method of making a supernova. It's not the one in M101, but this is a giant star, and this is a <clears> white dwarf. And they're close enough together that the white dwarf, this is a repeat of a comments from last week. The white dwarf is drawing off material from this giant star hydrogen that then lands on the surface and it builds up a mass of hydrogen. And when that mass becomes big enough, then it starts fusing and the fusing takes off. It's just like a uh, an explosion. It is an explosion, but it happens on the surface of the white dwarf star. Um, the type, there's another type of supernova, which is what the one in MOM, M101 is. And that is where a star has gone through all its stages of burning everything and then it runs out of fuel in the core and the core stops producing energy to push the star out and so the whole star collapses and then it rebounds in a gigantic supernova explosion so those are the two types the 101 um, is um, the type two this is an amateur's um, light curve of the supernova <clears throat> taken over, um, I thought that was the date. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, um, what is it called? Julian date, binary Julian date. So um, where they count the days as you change a day. So from eight to nine, that's one day. So he's taking measurements at the time, at the at the same time each night. There is a new plot, which I didn't put up, that shows the red continuing out about here and the blue down about here. So there the little, are different. The little comment down there in the lower right corner tells you the actual date. Yeah, the date in our date. Yeah, in the way we think of dates, yes. Right. So um, the supernova was turning on from around 12th magnitude now it's up around 11th magnitude which makes it easy in small scopes a uh, six inch telescope will under really good skies will go down to 13th magnitude so it could see the star at, uh, at any of these brightnesses but the blue is coming down the hotter the hotter stuff going on is cooling off first on the star the red is continuing on that's the um cooler stuff in the red color and the, so it's still going to be there for a while but the point is that from this shape on some of these let's see this is i'm going to get the type one and type two mixed this is um type two this is a this type, is two, two, yeah. Yeah. type two okay single, single star type here two. type two single star it's kind right. of funny yes they call it Thank type you. two <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's these little quirks that twist my mind, memory. When I was <laughs> taking a math test and I'd remember formulas, if I ever stopped and questioned myself in my mind, was that squared or was that you know not squared? <laughs> then I then I'm hopeless. Then I can't I can't settle yeah. on it during the test. <laughs> you got to go with confidence. Your first thought. So anyway, these shapes are characteristic of type one and type two. Type one has a very characteristic shape. And from the shape of it, um, you can curve fit it and you can and estimate the distance to it. Yep. So it's a it's a um, candles for uh, yep. our universe. Standard candle. Distance Standard candle. candle, yeah. If type two means only one star, then yeah. it's, it's not a white dwarf stuck on a collapse star. Yeah, or this right? is the core it's collapse a, run. Yeah. Okay. Core, it's just a funny the way they named it, uh, Ron, you know. Type, type two is a single star core collapse. Type well, one. Yeah, okay, anything that says nova means explosion, right? Supernova, <laughs> hypernova, kilonova. Yeah, yeah. Brightness, yes. I, I'm gonna put it that way. 
Okay. And yeah, so bright we're... object, new star. Mm -hmm. New star. Betelgeuse hasn't done it yet, has it? No, but it'll no. be a core collapse like this. Right. It could have done it, Ron. But we yeah. just <laughs> it reached yet. <laughs> According to YouTube, it's happening. You know, Michio Kako, I think, is saying it's uh, <laughs> It is well, acting it weird. Happened. It went through that period where it was dim right. for a while, and now it's it's brighter than normal. Yeah. God, amazing. So now we're going to go through a few planet finders here. This is Saturn and Neptune in the morning uh -huh. sky. Mm -hmm. You can see they're in um, Aquarius. Mm -hmm. And this was about... 1 30 in the morning just past midnight so it's up in the dark part of the sky i don't see the moon anywhere around but um no yeah by this time that's right the moon is set by this time because right. at first quarter it says yeah i saw that jerry I was just gonna say i saw the moon briefly saturday night when there was a crack in the clouds oh very briefly <laughs> we saw venus night before yep. last <clears throat> As we were looking at it, it clouded over. Yeah, I saw it uh, upwards of eleven in the evening. It's it's just hanging out there, you know. Can you gentlemen focus in and see with your telescopes the uh, four moons that we're talking about here: Rhea, Dion, Enceladus, and Tethys? Yeah, those are visible on Saturn. Yeah, there's six moons visible yeah. on Saturn with a usual backyard <laughs> telescope. Well, that is Saturn. I'm sorry. Uh, got it. But Neptune. We can't see their moons through our telescope, can we? Yeah. We can? Neptune, yeah. the farthest out? Wow. Depends how big your telescope is. <laughs> how this big is the moon picture, is. <laughs> this is a picture taken of Neptune um, in 1989. Mm -hmm. And it shows the its uh, moon in the same phase. So it's quite a dramatic picture. Wow, it's neat. Yeah, I could hear also Sprock Zarathustra from 2001 movie. <laughs> Lord, that's great. Yep. What which which of those heavy planets out there has nothing but uh Shakespearean names for its moons? Is that Uranus? Uranus. Neptune. Uranus. Uranus, they're all named from Shakespeare. Yeah, that was Shakespeare. that was the tradition for, for usually, convention. Usually yeah. female names from Shakespeare for female names are on moons, aren't they? They're Ariel and Umbriel. Cynthia for hours, right? Okay, fascinating stuff. Still learning. Okay. Then, um, where are we going now, Mr. Wizard? Saturday. I feel like I'm at Mr. Wizard's clubhouse, his laboratory on Saturday <laughs> morning. Hmm. Gosh, what if we pour this together in the same beaker, Mr. Wizard? <laughs> yeah, there's a big boom, there's a big supernova. Now, where did your eyebrows go, Mr. Wizard? <laughs> <laughs> We had a chemistry teacher who was, I was lucky in high school because all of my science teachers had, had master's degrees in their field. And then they learned to teach. Um, but the chemistry teacher, Mr. Miller, would uh, he, he always wore a short sleeve white shirt and a tie. And he was doing a thermite experiment to show us up on the desk in front of us. And he lit it and it didn't work. And so he, added some more of all the ingredients and he lit it and it didn't work. And to light it, you have a strip of magnesium sticking out of the top and you light the magnesium and it really burns. And so he did it a third time. He added more ingredients and this time he touched the flame, right? He didn't try and light the magnesium. He touched the flame to the ingredients and stuff. And there was this big flash <laughs> and smoke of, and um, he, um, he burned his eyebrows off. Wow. And he, his face was black. And the whole class laughed and he got mad. And he said, you're all, just, you're all just a bunch of little sadists. I hurt myself up here and you're all laughing at me and stuff. And when he oh. said this, he leaned forward and his tie uh, stuck in a beaker of acid. Oh. And, and that, that just laid the students on the floor. <laughs> he, he ordered all the students out and stuff. And then we heard about that because I had a, third period class with him that was first period right so that must be a, a common thermite type experience because my high school chemistry class uh the teacher was demonstrating thermite and he had this rolling table that was metal and then it had a rubber mat on it and then he had an aluminum tray 
with a bunch of sand. And he put the thermite ingredients in the sand and he lit it. But the thing about thermite is it provides its own oxygen. You know, you've got an oxidizer yeah. and the fuel there. Aluminum so, oxide. Yeah. So you just, you can't put it out, right? That's the whole idea. Right. That's and it right. burns underwater and everything. So it just started burning and he hadn't put enough sand in the tray. So it turned the sand around it to glass. It burned through the aluminum tray, through the rubber mat, <laughs> through the uh, iron table and down into the linoleum on the floor and burned a hole. He just yeah. keeps put it out. <laughs> I, I saw that seated alien. Yeah. 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 And so the whole classroom was filled with smoke. It was, uh, it was entertaining. Yeah. Well, I wonder if that's what, Sort of thing happened in Professor uh, Tom Whittemore's class out at the University of uh, Westmont. Did no, he... we, we didn't. We didn't mess with that kind of stuff. Oh, you didn't do experiments. <laughs> no, we built we we built analog computers. But it is a lab, isn't it? I guess labs you don't do experiments. You could have a computer lab. Well, labs are there's a wide variety of labs. Is During there... World War II, the uh, a weapon that was used was a thermite grenade. And wow. they would put these, they pull the pin and throw the thermite grenade down the barrel of an enemy gun and the thermite reaction would go off and it would weld, it would melt through or weld the barrel. So it was, it couldn't be used anymore. Wow. And, that's how and, and they're currently disabled. used, at least I know on Navy ships in the um, classified safes and stuff that if, if your ship is going to, you know, if you're going to abandon ship or you're, for some reason, you're worried that classified stuff will be captured. There are thermite grenades that you put into the classified documents and classified tapes and yeah. CDs, and you set them off to burn all that stuff up. Wow. Yeah. And it's used to weld railroad rails together too oh, yeah. when they repair them. It's wow. a very useful reaction. Anyway, here we are in the morning, and about an hour before sunrise, the moon is long <laughs> set, and you can see Uranus, Mercury, and Jupiter. Mercury mm -hmm. has just become a morning object, Uranus too. Jupiter's been a morning object for a while, but you know it's rising, uh, starting the cycle again of going through the sky to become an evening object over the next uh, most of a year. And Mars in the Beehive Cluster is nowhere to be seen. That's a separate... That's in the Western sky, Ron. Okay. Yeah. After That's sundown. Got it. Now, this is Mons Rumker. There he is. Um, this is like the, the moon right now is just past uh, first quarter, uh -huh. which means mm -hmm. that this is light and this was dark a few days ago. And now it's it's in a gibbous phase. So the light portion is growing. And just before full, this part, this part up here will be where the terminator is and so you'll get a lot of good contrast in the shadows for this and that's when you can see these low dome light structures that are eruptions of um, lava from below kind of like a goose egg if someone hits their head so <laughs> not a primary <laughs> landing spot for apollo or anything in the future is it they tended to land more in the um not really they tend to land more in the middle of the face over here than yeah, way out on the limb. Yeah. But this is the this is the south down here. And that's where the craters, that's where the prime landing spot for colonization is, because you have craters with uh, ice in them. And the craters in the crater, it's permanently in dark, but up on the rim of the crater, it's permanently in light. So you can have solar panels up there. Oh. So I'm that's surprised that the uh, with the ice in the bottom of the craters over the uh, you know the millions of years the moon's been there haven't sublimed away. There's well, actually, it's a trap um, because you you get the um, you get the water evaporated away from parts that are in sunlight, and as soon as they hit the cold, it, you know, they kind of there's kind of a an exosphere, a very thin atmosphere. Okay. And those molecules are traveling around, and and when they hit these cold spots, they condense down in there. So it actually acts the other yeah. way. It's it's collecting ice. Well, it's a way of. That? It's also a way of achieving very good vacuums because you put a, you freeze one part of the vacuum chamber, and that will cold trap any gas that's in there. The gas will stick to where it's cold. Well, right. normally there's a cold trap in the plumbing of the vacuum system too. Right. That's that's why you get it cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, are all the mountains in the solar system other than on Earth named Mons? Are they what? 
Are they named Mons? Well, it means mountain, mountain in mountain. Latin. So yeah, it means mountains in what language? Latin. 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 Mons Montes. Uh, Ron. Okay. Mons Montes, third declension masculine. <laughs> <laughs> So you suppose it would be in the Latin Bible, uh, Mount Ararat, for example, or does it even mention that? Uh, any mountain reference in Latin is Mons. And we, yeah. Mons, yeah. Mons, Mons, Mons is, yeah. That's what it means. It means mountain. And the big one on Mars, of course, is what, uh, five miles high? And right. Something like that. Wow. Yeah. You can see it's a source for languages like Italian and Spanish. Yeah, things Actually, like that. Olympus Mons is 15 miles high off the surface. Yeah. 50, yeah. Whoa. It's Mars. This this the is street. a picture taken in 2013. Okay. Um, three nights of Mars moving through the Beehive cluster. Beehive, yeah. So this is going to occur again later this week on June 1st. Yeah. I was going to say, Jerry, on that brief time, I had a crack in the clouds Saturday night. I could see Mars up in uh, Cancer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So this this is on the first. Okay. <clears throat> Mars is just entering M44. Mm -hmm. That should be spectacular. Yeah. It's it's a, great great opportunity. a little yeah. tiny telescope would be spectacular. Yeah. Binoculars, maybe. Yeah. There's Venus off to the right. Oh, yes. And it's too bad, you know, in this in the picture you showed uh, there with Mars, the color saturation is pretty good on Mars, but it's not very good on the stars because several yeah, of those are, are red giants and there's some blue ones. And so M44 yeah. is actually quite pretty in a color photo. Yeah. And Ron, just yes. to chase, oh, this is chase a little more Latin for you just for fun. You see those two stars there, Ocelos Borealis and Ocelos yep. Australis. Ocelos is Latin for... Uh, well, I'll say ass, but donkey. <laughs> it's a donkey. So the upper one's the northern donkey, and the southern one is a the, the other one's the southern donkey. Wow! They never put what does, uh, what does yeah. Acubar mean? Acuben. It's Acubens. Yeah. Oh, it's an N. Okay. <laughs> which is any which guesses is on what it means? Yeah, Don't and you know, claws you know, or something. Yeah, M M44 was also envisioned as the cradle where Christ was, you know, uh, born. Okay. And uh, the, the, these are the donkeys. These are the donkeys. It's sometimes called precipice, the manger, you know. Okay. Uh -huh. Donkeys have lots of synonyms. Ass, burrito, mule. <laughs> <laughs> and now we do a new one. Is this, where are we here, Captain? Okay, now we're looking at. Um, Let's go warp speed. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is in the double star area. Mm -hmm. There is a Porima here. Yeah. Uh, it's right near the moon on May 30 at 9 p.m. Yeah. But um, the moon will either day before day after the moon will be away from this stuff but these are stars and so that doesn't really get interfered too much these bright stars with the moon being close to it like that mm -hmm. so yeah, these are Parima's, boundaries in the constellation I just say, Gary, that Parima is a star that I use to you know diagnose whether I've made a good mirror or not <laughs> it's, a, it's a really nice type double it's a nice type double and it's it's yes. not just a double, it's a binary, right? So it's one of the few that over a course of a human lifetime, you can see a fair amount of change in it. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, in Virgo, there are two binary stars, Porima and Spica. Yes. Spica is way too tight to see it. You can't split it, but you can see it spectroscopically. That's a segue of what's coming. <laughs> and uh, Porima, though, you can switch over to Porima. And that is a very nice type, as uh, Tom just pointed out. Yep. You can split it. And this is a photograph of uh, Porima. There's a little clouds. And um, so it's not bothered by not perfect nights. Uh, the uh, diffraction pattern, the airy disk for these things, it's about one airy disk apart. 
this is a weird photo. It's like a superimposition of one photo on top of another. <laughs> and one of them's out of focus showing you those airy rings. Yeah. Yes, yeah. This, there's another star down here. What this is, I don't know. But the actual <laughs> field of view is a black circle in here. It's not the square. Okay. But I couldn't frame it to get the just the circle. So it is a weird photo. I don't know what this is. Yeah. Obviously, light source. But... Those are a couple of arc seconds apart, right, Jerry? Okay. Um, 2.3 arc seconds apart. They're pretty close. Yeah. yeah. There's 0.4 seconds apart. In the yeah. Battle. Yeah. The one, this photo shows them 0.4 seconds apart. Wow. Today they're 2.3 seconds apart. So you would how, see space between them. How does that translate into uh, light, what, minutes, light days? Seconds. Light, light seconds. They're that close? Light yeah. Seconds? Well, when you get down to light seconds, now you're in the resolution realm realm of our right. small amateur telescopes, right? And the atmospheric seeing. When you take a photograph, even a perfectly guided photograph, your photo, your stars in your photographs are going to be around two to three seconds of an arc across in diameter, because of the atmosphere. No matter how perfectly you guide it, no matter how much you get rid of the oh, uh, I I know I know mirrors. it. I understand what you're saying. Are you talking about uh, seconds versus minutes? The the little double. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I was talking about distance. It's it's distance. according to the caption distance. in there. It's it's forty three AU. So that's about a little over the distance to Pluto, between them. And how long does it take sunlight to reach Pluto? Four hours. So it's four light hours away from each other. Yeah. yeah. How come the one star has got the airy disk around it and the double star does not? Well, that's you can see this, where they superimpose one image on another there because they oh, partially oh, covered up the other one. Actually, I think this is an out of frame glint from something that leaked. Okay. Oh, you think it's a reflection, internal reflection? Yeah. That, that would be my guess. Okay. But <clears throat> recorder nebula. <laughs> what are we looking at here? Ah, a little history. Okay, now we're going to talk about spectroscopy for a moment. Spectroscopy. I'm really motivated by clarifications of redshift but um there was about 200 years ago a famous philosopher um, who believed that we will never know what stars are made of because we only have their light yeah. Lecomte. We, can't, we can't that was lecomte 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 yeah okay so um we only have their light to look at and then about 20 years later uh they discovered spectroscopy now this that 200 years ago would be about 1800. This is Isaac Newton splitting um, light into spectrum or a rainbow, as they put it, uh, in 1660. But they didn't look close enough to get into spectroscopy to figure that out. The slit, fairly was too wide. The, what? the slit that was, um, oh. the, was too wide. Yeah. He didn't use a prism? Well, they oh, did. Yeah. He wanted a nice bright rainbow, so he had a wide split, slit. So now, then, the, you know, the the uh, um, absorption lines were mm -hmm. overwritten or uh, clouded over by the adjacent uh, colors. So this is a, an energy diagram of a hydrogen atom. These are the orbitals, not orbits, but orbitals. Um, here is the first inner core orbital, the 1s state for hydrogen, the 2s state, and the transition between the second level up here, when an electron is up here and there is an empty shell below it, it can drop down um, and give up that energy. And that's when it emits a photon. And that photon for this transition is right here. It is the alpha um, line of the Lyman series, which is in the ultraviolet. And so when things get redshifted, this whole set of things will move this way toward the red. The, um, the one that we look at when we take pictures here is the transition from the third orbital to the second orbital. And that produces a very bright line, the hydrogen alpha line, the alpha of the Balmer series. And then there's another series that is out here called the Pashan series. 
out in the infrared. And these series go on forever. When uh, I think it was Balmer first discovered his, other scientists figured, oh, there must be one out here too. And that was Professor Lyman. And then he said, well, if he can get one, then I can get one too. And that was Pashan. So they got their uh, prizes for doing that. But this, these are the energy levels that produce each of these lines. Now, these are emission lines, and you'll see these against the dark black background as a bright line of the right color. Here, they're shown in black and white, and only parts of the Balmer series are shown because these are invisible. Not invisible, these are in the visible band. So this is at the red end. This is about 600 nanometers. Um, this, this is in the that part of the spectrum that shows that color, which I think is cyan. And this is uh, blue. So this spans the visible spectrum here. These other ones are in black and white because we can't see those uh, with our eye. You notice the x-axis is in frequency, which is reciprocally related to uh, wavelength. Yes, uh, it's not intuitive for me because I'm calibrated in um, microns or right. nanometers. Right. So it goes opposite from nanometers. This so is the, the number they give you there in the speed of light and you get the number you want. Yeah, it's petahertz. So it's right. very high frequency stuff. It's above well, nanohertz. So, so what anyway, we're looking at is the configuration we'll see mostly out in space because most there's mostly hydrogen, right? Is what yes, we're most everywhere hydrogen is in the ground state. Now, here we have a spectrum of the sun. And the sun and all of the spectral lines for atoms here are absorption lines. Now, an absorption line is when a photon comes in and it has this amount of energy. It excites an electron from this orbital to this orbital and absorbs the photon. So if you try and pass light through hydrogen, these lines here will all be missing. They will be absorbed. And that's exactly what you see here. Right. Now, the atmosphere of the sun has atoms in it, and that's what you see is these atoms with um, radiation trying to get through, but the atoms are absorbing it. This one up here is the um, hydrogen alpha line, and that's where the our solar telescopes look around this line. So um, the... Um, I was just going to mention something for Ron, just for Ron. So the red and the green and the blue Ron are produced by the continuous spectrum that the sun produces because it's a big ball of hot gas. And Jerry's talking about as, as, the, um, as you look through the atmosphere itself, then you get these uh, absorption lines that look like they're black. And that's yeah. just to clarify, exactly. it's the atmosphere of the sun, not necessarily the earth's atmosphere. That is right. right. That is right. But we're looking at a different, all those levels, that strata, they're all different yeah. elements, right? They're all, all different. They're all different. They not, each, each element has a different pattern of lines. So there's a lot of lines here that are right. hydrogen. This is right. just the brightest hydrogen line. So you have to match them all up to know that that element is there. Right. Um, and as, they are spread across the various colors. Right. Yes, they are spread just like I showed in the Pushan series and the Balmer series. You'll only yeah. see the Balmer series in this visible band. Right, so, right. And so, Ron, uh, I was just going to say for Ron, uh, if you were to have a glowing filament, it produces a continuous spectrum. So it would produce something that looks like the red, the green, and the blue background here. Right. Okay. It just broadcasts uh, continuously. Right. And okay. the reason, reason it does that, as Tom points out, is because there are no atoms in the sun. There are, it's a right. plasma, the, the nuclei and the electrons just pass each other by and they have for an instant, they emit in a color and the variation, it's always changing. The levels are very complex. So that's called a black body radiation. And that's what you see. And right. then the, in the atmosphere, it's formed atoms. And so these are absorbing. And so you see the black lines. Right. And you see the black lines, some of them are spread out and a little bit fuzzy. And that's caused both by the rotation of the sun and by the magnetic field. So this is yeah. by measuring the width of some of these lines, like the really obvious broad yellow ones there are from calcium. I think uh -huh. it is, or is that? Yeah, these, the, these two right here, that's the, blue, the, the doublet. Calcium, yeah. calcium would go blue, you yeah. know. Yeah, so is that is that calcium? Oh, these, are, these are, excuse me, these are sodium. Sodium, yeah, okay. 
Okay. So, so they, um, you can see they're wide and they're a little bit fuzzy on the edges. And some of that fuzziness on the edges tells you how strong the magnetic field is on the surface of the sun. And so you can scan a slit spectrograph across the sun like this and measure the magnetic field by this, it's called a Zeeman mm -hmm. effect of the broadening of these lines. And uh, that's how they measure the magnetic fields around sunspots. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'm confused. Oh, I'm confused because you're showing the, like up in the red, the hydrogen alpha line, which is a big wide black line. Yeah. How come then when we use a hydrogen alpha filter, you know, like a Lunt, uh, Lunt uh, telescope, we see it. You're saying you're, this is absorption. How does that relate to the emission line? You, uh, you and I couldn't afford to buy um, a, a solar telescope that had a filter so tight that it just just so looked at the absorption line. Oh, okay. You're looking around this region. Yeah, um, the, yeah. um, and the emission that you get, um, as has been correctly pointed out here, is due to the turbulence from a, a number of sources that that particular line is going through. Now, the sun has mostly hydrogen. Hydrogen is where the action is. So you can get solar telescopes that center on the sodium line or the calcium line, which is somewhere else down in here, probably this one. And um, you can get it, but those are much fainter. And so you, the, the image you look at of the sun in those spectral bands is much dimmer. The action on the sun for us amateurs is in hydrogen. But you've left me in a quandary because I always under, was under the impression that all the stars, like our sun, are layers of different uh, elements being no. created. No. Nu no. Nuclei. Just the nuclei. It's it's a it's a plasma, Ron. So the the yeah. electrons and the and the nuclei are separate. But also the sun is mostly hydrogen. Yes. It's just a, there, and there's helium. You know, there's some helium mixed in and some of these other elements in very small quantities. But it's only in the very, very massive stars that are producing the heavier elements that you get that onion structure where you have the different elements layered the way you're mm -hmm. thinking. But I got news for you. Hydrogen happens to be atoms. How no, they... hydrogen is yeah. protons. Really? Well, hydrogen. No, the sun has a hydrogen nuclei and a lot of electrons, but they're not in an atom. They're just parts <clears throat> laying around like from Ikea. You know, it's a hydrogen kit. There are four states of matter. Surface, you what? There are four states of matter. Yes. Solid, yeah. liquid, gas, and plasma. Yeah. So and it's only in the atmosphere of the sun that the atoms form, that the uh, proton can grab an electron and form an atom. But all the parts are in the sun. So look on the sun as a IKEA hydrogen kit. Well, and all those back things just tell us that the sun is a third generation star, that it's lucky to have all those darn elements, you know. Is it a those, those elements are like slight contaminants in the atmosphere <laughs> right. of the sun, and that's why right. we see them. Yeah, that's right. Well, that fourth status of matter, which is uh, plasma, isn't a fireplace flame plasma? Does that mean there's no atoms in there? It's all broken up protons and electrons? We produce plasmas here on Earth. Um, I think one form of welding uses plasma. Yeah, and yes. certainly the fusion reactors we're trying to make use plasma. It's actually a cutter for steel. They use plasma. Yeah, that's it, yeah. And so it rips the atoms apart. It's also found in hospitals. Yeah, well, that's a different kind <laughs> of plasma. So any, any free proton by itself is automatically a, a hydrogen item to be? or It's it's a hydrogen I, ion. Hydrogen, think of it's it. a hydrogen ion. It's yeah, ion yeah. It's hydrogen. <laughs> And it's searching for an electron, and they are opposite. So yeah, they should get together, but they can't because it's too damn well, hot. Well, so much energy because of the temperature that they can't. The, the thermal energy, which is making everything vibrate, pushes them apart stronger than the, uh, you know, the, the intermolecular forces that are trying to pull them together. Okay. Well, in that giant ball of the sun, for jillions of years, is all these little particles including uh, your photons, which isn't really matter particles, it's all energy, right? The photons and electrons are moving around and protons, neutrons, are they in there too? There's some, but they're, they tend to be in atoms, you know, like the high, the helium is, is neutrons and protons. It's H2, it's got two neutrons. 
Well, somebody told me that neutrons were a combined proton and electron. Is that yeah, right? you can think of them that way. Yeah. Okay. Can they They're separate all quarks and they've got different uh, okay. orbitals in them? But they they don't. A neutron is by itself is unstable and it decays in about fifteen minutes when it's in empty space. When oh, really? a star becomes super condensed and it has a very strong gravitational field, then gravity will force the electrons and protons together to produce neutrons. And then the entire star becomes a neutron star. That's the reason, because they're all jammed together and they got no place like to gravity. Go. Okay. This one, this is the uh, uh, um, trap of um, redshift. Roses are red. Well, sometimes they're blue depending on their velocity relative to you. <laughs> they don't really change color like this, except in extreme cases. The individual lines move around. Uh, and if it's a background color, the background radiation would move too. But this, for example, <clears throat> is a star that is moving toward you. <clears throat> this is the star at rest. And this is the hydrogen alpha line of the Balmer series. And here the, the line is shifted toward the blue. It's still red, but it's shifted toward the blue. So it's moved. So you'd have to have an instrument to measure this offset. And then here, it's, if it's moving away from you, the line has moved more to, into the deeper red toward the infrared. And again, you'd have to have a spectra like this, spectrum to measure this offset. And then you could get the rate at which it's moving away from you or toward you or at rest. Now, oops, in the case of a rotating star, uh, Chuck mentioned this, in a non-rotating star or slowly rotating star, you get a single spectral line. This is in the green, you see. So this is the sodium doublet. They're putting it as a singlet, but right in here is where we have sodium that burns. If you put salt on a stick and put it in a candle flame, you'll get a nice green flame. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it looks yellow, bright yellow. Yellow, yeah. My wife and I go through this. You know, so we, have different, we have different color vision. We can't decide on green and teal. So if it's rotating very rapidly, then you will see both um, part of the star moving toward you, and you'll see part of the star moving away from you. So you get a Doppler shift, a blue Doppler shift, and a red Doppler shift at the same time. And that effectively, that's one of the ways you make <clears throat> a line broad and fuzzy. So it can also um, have other influences on it, as Chuck pointed out, that cause it to be broad. So you have to figure out what's going on in detail. Yeah, bloodline so broad here is rotation, right, Jerry? But you what could also that? have, I said line broadening <laughs> for this example is because of the rotation of the star, but you could have line broadening because of the motion, motion of the atoms and things like that. Yeah, and also the Zeeman effect, as Chuck pointed out. That's right, magnetic. That magnetic. splits it, though. Right, that tends to split it yeah. both ways, yeah. Yeah, okay. the D-lines are easy to split. Yeah. Well, the same concept happens when they're looking at galaxies that are rotating, right? Yes. Yes, exactly. Of... So you can tell how fast they're rotating, which part is mm -hmm. going away and which part's coming toward you. Mm -hmm. This is a white dwarf comparison. Um, has the mass of our sun, but the size of our earth. And this is a blue giant star. And these are spectra of that. The, in this case, it's line broadening due to high pressure and turbulence so that you get a spectra that looks like this. Um, blue giants are low pressure. Um, and so you get a spectra with very narrow tight lines. So that's, this is another one of the things that can broaden the lines. Huh. Now, the one thing that we've had people talk about a lot and is tricky to get is called the Lyman forest. Now, remember, Lyman is one of these series of lines. And what you do is, in the case of uh, the sun, where we saw black body radiation, um, and then we saw the absorption lines on it, because it's a bright light source in the background, and the atmosphere on the way out is going to um, absorb some of that light and produce dark lines. You can find another bright source, which is a quasar. Uh, you may hear more about this Friday. Yep. But uh, when our speaker will discuss quasars, 
And in order to get to us, the light has to travel through intervening gas that is normally quite dark. So um, you can, in this gas, you get an absorption line from the um, Lyman series, which is these hydrogen absorption lines, and it looks like a forest of them. For each one of these, you get their different cloud in the way that's doing an absorption. So these are like absorption lines in the space from gas you wouldn't normally see um, as it travels toward Earth. And, and, and the this, reason it's this... so spread out like that and such a mess is because each one of those little clouds that it goes through is receding from you at a different velocity. So all these forests are getting shifted over each other and you have to pull them out. You got to do like a Fourier analysis on it to pull each of them out and get the different moving clouds that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. And that's a way of looking at the expansion of the universe. Yes. And why don't we see that forest on the right side of that picture, that diagram? Because uh, it's moving away from you in general. Okay, well... So each of the lines of the left forest represents a different cloud that it came through. The gas. Yes. There's a the pattern in there represents you there. Um, there's not a single line per cloud. There's a whole four, there's a whole Lyman Alpha series per cloud. Right. So you have so, to pull out all those groupings. So there'll be a there'll be the brightest or darkest line here, and then there'll be a fainter line there and a fainter line there and a fainter line there. And you have to match that they have a relationship between them. So you got to pick those out. And then you, that tells you the information about that cloud, that clump of hydrogen. And so your yeah, formal name for that is superposition. Yeah. Okay. It's the superposition of all those individual spectra. Uh-huh. Uh. But we can't do to any of those distant stars as detailed a version as you just presented on the sun while ago with all those strata and colors everywhere they're farther away they're fainter so you don't get really clear high high um, power spectra like that these are faint they take long exposures to capture and big telescopes yeah and, big telescopes and there's a big wide then, variety, right? There's stars. And you have a small army of graduate students to try and figure out which line. No, they'd use computers for the it's a galaxy background. Well, you just convolve the spectrum with your own spectrum and you see where, you know, it'll tell you where it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so are there any questions on any of this? Because we've come to the end of my charts. Um, you know me, I'm overwhelmed with questions, of course, but uh I thought maybe we'd continue this in a, in future programs. We're seeming to enjoy ourselves and what the little lines mean. And every element has its own. I guess it's yeah. like a chart for itself. But this uh, Professor Ski, that's what they call him. I guess he's a skiing magnet there, Professor. No, he's got a Polish name. Uh, Antonucci. Oh, he's Italian. Oh. <laughs> It has nothing to do with skiing, I swear. All right. Well, yeah, Robert he's he's a, he's a big skier, Antonucci. Oh, he is a um, skier. Okay. And um, just a warning that the talk on Friday, he's going to talk about quasars. He's notorious for going off on rants. Uh, so we'll see. It, it should be pretty entertaining. Well, already in communicating and setting this up, I've learned <clears> that <throat> there's a little thing that looks like a y and it says what no y that's range. a gamma run that's a Greek. i know that gamma. now i wonder <laughs> yeah. how many people knew that and, and he didn't even know it but it's going to be an interesting evening as we move into fleischman with yeah. 100 chairs or more and, and we're still going to have our little pre-show at seven o'clock uh, before yeah. the 7 30 meeting uh down near the creek in that beautiful planetarium with chrissy cook and everybody you gentlemen please take care of yourselves and your wives and your health and jerry uh have Happy birthday a little early and uh, don't fall down anymore. You look okay. I just got over my cold. It looks like Bruce is back with us, having weathered his problem. And No, and I've still got a drain in my oh, soul. Yeah. Yeah. We're just waiting for the next shoe to drop at our age, gentlemen. You know that. <laughs> so as long as it's not us in total of dropping, that's fine. <laughs> we will convene again after the Friday meeting on Monday of next week in the month of June. I guess that'll be the sixth, won't it? And uh, that'll be number 120 of the SBAU Astro Hour. I learned so much.
Thank you, Mr. Wizard and crew. You're all so intelligent and incredible, and I'm learning, and I can't wait. By the to way, you know, you said you were overwhelmed. You yep, can be overwhelmed or underwhelmed. Have you ever just been whelmed? You know, you got a good point. I try to spend my life just going through whelm, being whelmed. All time. <laughs> Take care and thank you everybody for watching and listening. Tell everybody about it.